Today we're going to be learning Yevamo Daf Mem Bet, Ma'adim Lesimcha. Um, we're going to start at the bottom of Mem Aleph Amu Bet. We're continuing along this issue about the three-month waiting period that we've been discussing for a while. Tanu Rabbanan. So the Brighta says, bottom of Mem Aleph Amu Bet, two lines from the bottom. Yevama Shachatzula Achim Betoch Shlosha. We have a Yevama who, they did Chalitza within three months. Now, normally you're supposed to wait the three months. What if they did Chalitza before? Now, it's really okay because Chalitza is not any, you're separating from the husband, so it's from the brother, so it's fine. She still needs to wait the three months in order to get remarried. She wants to marry somebody else, so she has to wait the three months. But after three months pass, if it, if she does the chalitza after three months passes, she doesn't need to wait for three months. So Havi, they asked a question. First they're going to infer, and they're going to question it. From when, from when do we count the three months? Not from the time of the chalitza. We're talking about three months from the time, right? It seems pretty clear here. We're talking about three months from the time of death. Maishnami get. Why is this any different though than a get issue? Now, why get and what about get? So we're going to see. When do we count the three months from get? So there's actually a machlok at Rav and Shmuel about it. Rav says it's from the moment you give the get. Shmuel amal mishat ktiva, from the time you write the get. Why would you write the get? So there's an assumption, there's something called a get yashan. We've actually discussed this before, which is a get that after you write the get, the couple is back together again, okay? They, they are back in the same room, and then we have to be concerned that they have relations. If so, then we're going to have an issue because that apostles disqualifies the get. So therefore, one can make an assumption that from the moment the get is written, before the husband gives it to the wife, before they're even divorced, the couple is not, <coughs> is not allowed to have relations together. So therefore, based on this, what do we say? If, according to Shmuel, we go by the time the get was written, but according to Rav, we go by the time it was given to her, then even though we know they're separated from the time it was written, we still, according to Rav, we don't allow it until actually the time he gave the get. How does that compare to us? So we're going to say that with us, with our situation, when he dies, we know they're already not having relations. He's dead. But you might have to wait till the formal act of Chalitza that does the separation between them which is like, right, even though it's not the same thing, it's quite different, but right now they're suggesting maybe it would be the same. And therefore it's a formal act that does it rather than whether, you know, the moment we know they're no longer together. So that's the question. Um, Arava Kavachomer. No, it's an obvious Kavachomer here. Okay, it's not like I could have come up and I'm sure the Gemara could have come up with a number of other answers as to why these cases are not really the same. But Rava gives this answer. The, the moment of death, like the moment of the, the, right, the moment of death in general is a moment where, let's say, we want to permit her to do yibum, right? When do we start counting? Right? We, we basically say it's the moment of death that's the one that determines um, when we count. We say, you can do yibum. This is a case where they did chalitza and she wants to marry someone else. What allows you to do yibum with the brother? Remember, the brother is forbidden by karet if you sleep with your husband's brother. But in yibum, we forbid it. And from when do we count the three months? From the time of death. There is no chalitza or other formal act. It's the time of death. So if the time of death can be used to count those three months, then obviously the time of death could be used to count the three months to permit her to go marry somebody, which is only an Isor love. Remember, if she if she goes and marries someone else, when she's not, right, before she does Yibum or Chalitza, so that's an Isor love. So basically, we're going to say, if the three months from death is enough to permit Isor Kareid of her brothers, her husband's brother, of course it's going to be enough to permit her to marry somebody else. So therefore, it's clear that it's three months from the time of death, and we don't make any sort of comparison to get because it's a different because of this kavachomer. V'chein shal kol anashim. This is a quote from the Mishnah. The Mishnah said not only does the Yavama have to wait three months, but all women have to wait three months. 
So Bishlam Ayivama Kedamaran. We understand why Ayivama needs to wait three months. Ela Sharkala Nashem Amai, but why all the other women? Amrav Nachman, Amr Shmuel, Mishum Daka, Amr Da Amr Kali, Ot Lechal Elohim, Ol Zaracha Acharecha, Laavchim Ben Zarosh Rishon Ol Zarosh Hashini. There's a pasuk in Sefer Breshit, chapter 17, which says, God is promising, I'm going to give my, my covenant to you, to me and your children after, in order to be your God and to, to your children after, which means that the understand from here, God is basically saying, I'm going to be your God and my presence will be upon you. That's only though if you are connected to your children, meaning we know who's who. If we don't know who's who, then there's no shechina. So therefore, we say you want to know exactly who your father is so that you can have the God's presence upon you. So it's a reason that it's a little bit harder for us to grasp what exactly the meaning of this is. But they seem to think that there's this importance of knowing who your father is and who your parents are in order to be able to continue, right, to, for God to be, um, his presence to be upon you. So Mativ Rav, Rav says, I have a bit of a question with this. It says in a bright, So also a convert, okay, a male and a female convert, need to wait three months as well. In other words, a ger and gioret that got married, the, um, sorry, they were a ger and a gioret that converted. Before they get married again, after they convert, they have to wait three months. Okay, we no longer do this. I had a wedding in my house last week between a woman who converted. Um, they were already married, but now she converted. And, and they needed another wedding. That's what you do. So because it had to be done the day of the conversion, so we put together a wedding in our house and uh, we married them. So now we don't do this waiting period of three months anymore. But according to this bright, you have to wait three months. So why? What's this between your zarachah to know whether it's from before or from after? It doesn't, right? Everyone who converts is, is like they're born anew. It doesn't really, right? No one knows there is even... And it's, what, what's the issue here? And what does this have to do with anything? So, right, Rashi says we're specifically talking about not the situation I just said, but a ger shenit gayer v'ishtoimo. Okay, we don't do this anymore, mainly because it would be, right, it would be hard, hard to say, oh, you were married before, now we're converting you, and now you can't live together. It would be very difficult. So in general, we don't do this. But according to this bride, you do. So now, um... So what, and, and also, by the way, we're talking, what they're, what they're really saying is, there's no two husbands here. It's basically the husband before and the husband after. It's the same person. So it's not like we need to know which child was it connected to. That's really the issue here. So, You want to be able to distinguish between a child that was conceived when they were Jewish and a child that was conceived before they were Jewish. Okay, what the ramifications of this are, right? There's different possible ramifications. Um, we talked about how a, a woman who converts with the fetus inside, the kind of the conversion is done because of the mother, but the, the child is still considered a convert rather than a child that's conceived after, which then wouldn't be considered a convert. There's certain ramifications. For example, if it's a woman, she can't marry a Kohen, although many people are, are working to actually Paskin based on a different Sikat Halakha, which is only from age three is she considered a convert that can't marry a Kohen, and therefore this wouldn't really make a difference. So anyway, there's different possibilities as to what the meaning of the, you know, what the importance of this is. Rava gives a different explanation, okay? As opposed to the first explanation about having the Shekhinah come upon you because your children go after you. So he gives a different. For this, we'll pull up the presentation. He says... Okay, he's going to give a, four different possible things that we could be concerned about. Okay, the first is maybe you'll marry your sister for, through your father. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's very simple. If we're not sure who your father is, if you get married within three months, so we have our situation here. We have Shula who's married to um, no, sorry, let's start with the El is married to Ruvain. And then they get divorced. Okay, she's our mother that we're concerned about. She's the one who's going to give birth to this kid named David. So Yael and Reuven have a child named. Uh, so Yael and Reuven are married. They get divorced. Then within three months, she marries Moshe, and then she has a baby, David. We don't know is David a ninth month baby to Reuven or a seven month baby to Moshe. Now, if Reuven has another wife, Shula, and has a child, Hannah, so if David is Moshe and Yael's son. Then he might likely, okay, all these scenarios, by the way, are going to assume that we're going to, most people are going to think that he belongs to 
the second husband, Moshe, because he's born while Yael is married to Moshe. So if that's the concern, we're worried that he might end up marrying his sister, who he shares a father with, which is Reuven. Because maybe if he's Reuven's son, he'll end up marrying Reuven's daughter with, with Reuven and Shula, who have absolutely nothing to do with Yael and Moshe, who are right, who he thinks his parents are. And he knows his mother's Yael. He just doesn't know if Moshe is the father. So he can end up basically marrying his sister, thinking he has no connection to her. Again, sister through the father. Obviously, he's not going to marry his sister through his mother because he knows she's his sister. Second concern. Yibem eshet achiv meimo. If Moshe and Yael have another son named Yonatan, right now we still don't know is David Moshe's son or Reuven's son. So if we think he's Moshe's son, but really he's Reuven's son, he could end up marrying Yonatan, who is his brother through his mother, not his father, if he's Reuven's son, they share a mother, not a father, but people will think, or he'll think that they share a father, because he'll think he's been born to Moshe. And then he'll end up marrying, if Yonatan dies without children, and Yonatan was married to Devorah, and they don't have children, Devorah will do Yibam with David. Now, David is his mother, is his, he's, in other words, if he belongs to Reuven, then they don't share the same father, which means there is no Yibam. But they are brothers through their mother because they share the same mother. So basically, he's going to end up sleeping with his brother's wife, which is against the law because there is no obligation of Yib. Or Yibem Eshet Achiv Meimo. He could end up, right? Oh, sorry. This is the case. So here I just went to the next page, which is Devorah goes and does Yibum with David. And that is a forbidden relationship. Okay, next. Yotzi at Imola Shuk. Assuming Moshe has a brother named Aaron. Okay, now if Moshe dies without children, now he has David, so they'll think that David's his son. Right? Remember, that's the one that was born to the Yael, this woman who married Moshe within three months. So she marries Moshe within three months. They have this baby, we don't know whose it is. We think that it's Moshe's baby. So Moshe dies without any other children, and they don't realize that Yael is supposed to do even with Aaron, Moshe's brother. So Yael goes and marries somebody else, which is forbidden for her to do. So basically, if Yael goes and marries somebody else, that will be a problem, thinking that she had David with Moshe, and but really he belonged to Reuven. So she'll end up having married someone without, right? That's an Isor Lav. It's, it's not correct, but it's pretty serious. The final concern is that if, again, we're not sure if David is Reuven or Moshe's son, and Reuben has another son named Shlomo, and Shlomo dies without children, and Chana is his wife. She theoretically is supposed to do Yibum with David if he's really Reuben's son, because they're brothers through the father. But since we don't know, and we think he belongs to Moshe, she's going to go get married. And, you know, so he's going to mess up his mother potentially not doing Yibum, and he's going to mess up his brother's wife potentially not doing Yibum. Okay, now. Because really, he was supposed to do even with her, but he didn't realize that they were brothers through the father. So those are all our concerns that Rav suggests. Much of Rav Hananya. Rav Hananya now brings a, a problem with this approach, Rav's approach. It says in a brighter, B'kulon ani kore bahem ishum takanat erva. All these forbidden relationships that the rabbis instituted, all these things, are all because of erva problems. V'kan, but this institution that the rabbis instituted, who can't marry or when they can't, the three-month issue, is Mishum Takanaf Lad. It's because of the offspring that we're worried about. Vim Itan, if it was really all the concerns Rava said, it really is Erva concerns, because it could be Isur Karit, could be she married someone she wasn't supposed to marry, you know, she didn't do Yibum, and that's an Isur Lav, but that's all Erva. So, Vim Itan, Kulu Mishum Takanaf Erva. It should have said all of these are Takanaf Erva, including this list. So, what do they explain? It's really the Vlad. It's just the Vlad, the offspring, is the one who's causing Erva issues. So you could still call it Takanat Erva, a Takanat Vlad, but it really means Erva. So that's not really such a problem. Now we're going to get into a slew of questions that I already, I'm going to tell you from the start. The Gemara had possible answers, easy answers they could have answered for this. I'm not sure why they didn't, or at least, or maybe I'm misunderstanding it. Possible. But it seems to me like there's pretty basic, easy answers to why this is not the case. But they're going to raise some questions, give their own answers. I think it's possible they could have given other answers as well. What they want to focus now is on why three months. So, Bishlama tamtin shnei chodashim v'tina lo. We understand why she can't wait two months and get married. Because if she waits two months, it's married after two months, has a baby after seven months. It's exactly our concern, right? E bartish'ah lekama 
Ibar Shiva Lebatcha, right? That, sorry, I skipped two words, Tahainu Sveka. That's exactly our debate. We're, we're assuming in all these cases, and this is why it's a little problematic, that she gets pregnant, that she gives birth within seven months. And then we're going to worry it's seven months to this one, nine months to that one. So in the case of two months, we understand it's a total issue. It's exactly it. Seven months to that, nine months from the death of the husband. It would be, a, with the first husband, it would be a big sveik. But you could say, she could wait one month and then get married. If she gives birth seven months later, if she gives birth exactly seven months later, it must be seven months from the other, from the new husband. Because, now here's the tricky part, because we're assuming, when did the husband die? Eight months ago. So eight months is never going to be a Vlad Shal Kayama. Remember, an eight-month baby never makes it. Why they don't say, it could have been she got pregnant a month before. We don't really know why they don't suggest that. Maybe I'm missing something, but for some reason, they don't think that's a possibility. It doesn't concern me so much because in the end, they're going to reject it for some other reason. So they could have rejected it for that reason as well. Let's say she gives birth eight months later. So hi, Bartish Alakamahu. Then it's obvious it's nine months from the first husband because then, okay, so here they say they're jumping a month back, right? It was basically a nine-month baby. Theoretically, you could say maybe it's a nine-month baby that was born early, okay? But it's a little, again, it all really depends on how you understand the eighth-month baby, or maybe she got pregnant a month before he died. But they say, all right, so here they're going to say, it. So now they say no, because it's not clear it's going to be the nine-month from the other one, because it could be. Just because you give birth eight months after having um, gotten married, maybe it's from the second guy. Maybe she waited a month before getting pregnant. It could be seven from the new one. So, again, their rejection shows that their question is a little bit off because obviously, right, we would have said that. You know, it's just because it's eight months from the moment she got married doesn't mean it's a nine-month baby to the other one. It could really be a seven-month baby and they just waited a month before she got pregnant. Why doesn't she wait two and a half months? That should work. Why? If she gives birth exactly seven months later, it's clearly seven to the new one. Because they're, again, they're just assuming if it's exactly seven months, it'll be seven to the new one. Even though, not necessarily. If it's six and a bit, then Bartisha Lakamahu, then seven months haven't passed, it must clearly be a nine month baby. So then they say, but, right, to Ibar Batrahu, Barshitu Palgalochai, right? Because we're assuming if it was from the first guy, or the second husband, a baby's not going to be able to be born in six and a half months and survive. So then they say, Inami, ah, you could say, Lashitu Palgayalda. No, you could say, really, she could give birth six and a half months later for a seven month baby. Ikalamemar de It really could be. How do we know this? Now, before we continue, I want to just point out what's medically accurate and what the rabbis say. Right nowadays, people assume the later the baby's born, the more likely the baby's going to survive. In those days, they believed that this, there was something about an eight-month baby and that was not going to be a viable baby. So it's either seven or it's nine, but it's not that eight. Okay? How far we go with that, we're going to see in a minute, depending on the different opinions. So now, you would assume that Right, nowadays, if it's eighth month, it has more of a chance of survival than seven month, right? Even though, thank God, nowadays, modern medicine, many seven month babies do survive, but there's more, the more, the longer, obviously, we know it's better. They didn't really understand things that way. So now they say, Even if you believe that a nine month baby doesn't, isn't born like in the beginning of the ninth month, that's more like an eight month baby, but it needs to like, it needs to basically have the full nine months. Okay, again, there were these different opinions about this. So even if you say that, everyone agrees, and even though this is counterintuitive, specifically seven-month babies could be born into the seventh month. Okay, beginning of the seventh month, which is really like six and a bit months pregnant, pregnant could. And that proves six and a half is going to be a problem because you still then could say it's maybe the seven-month baby. How do we know this? Interestingly, they're going to prove it from the Nevi'im, from Sefer Shmuel, with Chana. So by Chana, when she finally has Shmuel, she gives birth, it says, 
Tkufot means seasons, and yamim means days. So they say tkufot is plural, that means two. Right? Mi'ut tkufot, the minimum is shnaim. Right? When you put anything in plural, minimally it means two. It means there were two seasons that passed, that's 62 months. And, I'm um, sorry, six months. And then mi'ut yamim is shnaim. Minimum days, l'tkufot hayamim. So that's two seasons and two days. So that adds up to six months and two days. So they explain from here, Chana must have given birth after six months and two days. And from here you see that it works. So now that you could give birth, in which case that's why it can't be two and a half months. So now they give one last suggestion. Why doesn't she wait like a week or so and then get married? Then we'll check exactly three months later. We'll see if she's pregnant. If she's pregnant, it's clear it's from the first husband, the first pregnancy, the first husband. If not, we'll assume it's the next, right? It's from the next. And that's when she eventually gets pregnant. It must be she wasn't pregnant at the three-month point. So, you know, if she's pregnant a week later, we can assume it comes from the second husband. So now they say, how are they going to check her? So the assumption is that they check her breasts because her breasts change while she's pregnant. So now, Amar of Safra, It's not exactly appropriate for their husbands, the people who are checking women like that. They didn't like that. Of course, not so appropriate for the women either. I'm not really sure why they don't say that. But in any case, they seem, right, this is classic that the Gemara is focused mainly, right, unless it's a particularly women issue, which again, you could say this is a women issue, but they're looking from their vantage point, right? You can't blame them really because that was their vantage point. So obviously in a case where it wouldn't be an issue for him, but would be an issue for her, maybe they would bring up her issue. But in this case, it's already an issue for the men. Not so, you know, they're not so happy that people are checking out um, they're women and whether they're pregnant or not in this way, it's not so appropriate. So, why don't we pick a more appropriate way? Here's an interesting assumption. The assumption is that women are heavier when they're right, not just in weight, but in the way they walk when they're pregnant. So therefore, their steps are, are deeper. So their footprints are deeper. So that means that we could check their footprints and check by that whether they're pregnant. Interesting method. So, Amarami Brahama, Isha Mechapa Atzma Kadesh Yirash Ben Abba Nechsei Bala. This is a fascinating line. All sorts of things you learn about their society in today's half, especially. So, women would try to tiptoe around or not press heavily on the floor so that no one would suspect them of being pregnant because they didn't want people to think that they were pregnant with the first husband's baby because they wanted to ensure that their next son would get a proper inheritance from his father who's still alive. And therefore she wanted the son who was better financially for the son to be considered of the next husband's child. So therefore, right, obviously, unless the father had a huge inheritance, but I guess the assumption is he died. And now we have someone who's alive, who's still making money, who can therefore pass on inheritance to his son. So therefore she'd rather that. So therefore we can't check her footprints because she might fake them out a little bit so that we won't catch on to her. Very interesting uh, theory here. Again, whether this is true or not almost doesn't matter to the Gemara. What they're trying to say is there's no foolproof way to check, and that's why we have to wait the three months. And that's really all these seemingly strange suggestions were really just suggestions to try to say maybe there's some other way to do it, and in the end they basically say no. It sounds like what they're saying from all this, though, if we know her to be pregnant, for sure, then it sounds like she'd get married because there's no concern over who the child is. We already know she's pregnant with the first one, so it'll be clear. Well, if that's the case, Salamatanya, and then since it seems like that's implied from all these sources, why does it say in a bright time? This would go back to this interesting halacha we saw earlier. Lo yisa adam chavero chavero. You can't marry a woman who's pregnant or nursing someone else's child. And now we're going to finally understand this case a little bit better, although it's going to be quite strange to the suggestions they're going to suggest. Again, based on perceptions they had of how they understood without having modern science. So, if he did marry her, he has to divorce her. So, it can't be that once he knows she's pregnant, he can marry her. Because then you have a separate problem. He can't marry her when she's pregnant. Why is this? We're worried that you're going to turn the the fetus that's inside into a sandal, which basically means you're going to crush it because you're going to get her pregnant, and that one fetus is going to basically crush the other. So then the Gemara says, wait a minute, if you're worried about that, then you have to worry even when the couple's married, 
when she gets pregnant, then they can't have relations. And it never says you can't do that. His own child, he can't then have relations with his wife when she's, when she's pregnant. So, there's two answers given as to why you can do that. One is either you use birth control, which is very interesting to think about because it's specifically the time when people don't use birth control. Or, right nowadays, or we say, let God help. Okay, we, we hope that God protects the, the fetus inside and we do what we do. So if you say that, hachanami, you can say the exact same thing here. Husband B can come and marry her, no problem. Either they can have relations using a ball, right, birth control, or, right, it means putting something inside to block the semen from going in, or, we'll hope God helps. So, we're concerned that he's going to crush her while they're having relations and, and endanger the fetus. So, of course, they say, well, then we're worried about a regular husband that will do that. You know, it doesn't have to be only in this unique situation. And, again, nobody ever says that you can't do that. So, if it's your own child, you're going to be more gentle about it and you won't crush her which will crush the fetus which might cause the child to be in danger the fetus to be in danger so right again there's this weird concern which in the end is going to right we're going to reject all this by the way but in the end we are going to see that there's this concern the new husband is not going to really care too much about this fetus so ella well they're now going to say the whole pregnancy thing has nothing to do with her being pregnant specifically because there's danger to the fetus now it's because Stamuber Limini Kakaima, moving to Amubet now, we're going to assume anyone who's pregnant, the assumption is she'll have a child and then she'll become nursing. So the whole issue is the nursing issue. And therefore, when she's pregnant, the concern is she'll be nursing soon and then we don't want them to be married. So that's why we don't let them marry now because she has to go through nursing still. Dilma Yabra, Umeacha Chalava, Umeacha In other words, again, what's the concern? Maybe she'll get pregnant while she's nursing. And then it will dry up the milk supply, and then it'll kill the baby. And that we don't want. So we have nami. So then again, we have this problem. How can the husband, right? Her regular husband, if it wasn't this kind of situation, her husband was still alive. He can't have relations with her when she's nursing because maybe she'll get pregnant. So Ah, he can supplement with, right? He can buy eggs and milk for the child, and the child won't starve. So then they say again, ping pong back to this case then with the extra husband, right? The new husband who comes in, who marries her when she's married, when she's pregnant or nursing. So he'll get some extra eggs and milk for the kid and, you know, the kid will survive. So, lo yav la By the way, it's interesting to see what the kid, little, kid, little babies ate. They ate eggs and, and milk, right? It's funny. Nowadays, my memory is right. We don't give kids eggs right away unless it's changed since my kids were little, but right, we don't give them eggs right away. It's actually something people could be allergic to, but they eggs and milk, right? Milk is also something you don't give them right away. You give them formula, but not actually milk. Anyway, um, so what do they say? Lo yav labal. The husband won't give her the money for it. That costs money. He'll say, that's not my kid. I don't need to give you money for that. To which the final question, and it again gets to some interesting assumptions about, right? First of all, it's just interesting to think about a husband. He'll starve his wife's first children. You know, he won't care about them. But the Lidbi she could go to the heirs of the, right? Whoever else inherited the possessions of the, her husband and say, I need money for my, for my baby. That's very strong. The woman is embarrassed to go to the court. And on account of that, she might end up killing her son because, again, if she marries this other guy, she'll get pregnant, her milk will dry up, and she'll be embarrassed to go to the court and ask, demand money from the heirs of the, her first husband's estate. Why is she embarrassed? It's a good question. Um, I was thinking about the fact that um, she might, right, they might claim, um, why did you go get married to somebody else? You know, why doesn't he pay for it? Right, you, you can imagine that situation would come up. They'd say, oh, you now have a new husband. Because right? once she gets remarried, she kind of disconnects from the old family. And if she goes and says, listen, I need money for, for this guy's son, they'll say, you know, well, you got a new husband. Let him take care of it. Or maybe she'll be embarrassed that she married someone else, right? It'll cause her, like she doesn't, like they'll say, oh, we told you so, you know, and now look, you got pregnant and now you can't support the child on your own, which you could have with your nursing milk and you dried up. So she doesn't want to start an issue. You can kind of see that. 
So anyway, that's an interesting, uh, very interesting sugya. Hard to, you know, it's very different from our reality nowadays and what we know about modern science. It's interesting to see how they uh, approach these things and what kind of answers they gave. And, you know, again, you have to remember, they're pushed into a corner to say things here. So it could be that everything they're saying is not exactly true. It's just trying to get you an answer to answer the questions that they had. Okay, back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah had said everybody needs to wait three months, and then it ta- we had a three-way machlok. Tanakhama said, I'll read you the whole Mishnah now. I'm going to go part by part. Echab etulot, echab ulot, right? Whether they're virgins or non-virgins. Whether they're grushot or almanot, divorcees or widows. Whether they're married, nisuot, they were married before, or arusot, or just engaged. So then, that was the first thing. Rabbi Yehuda says, hanisuot yitar suva, arusot yinasu, the ones who are married can get engaged, and because engagement doesn't mean you're you're having relations, so there's no concerned of the confusion about the children. And the ones who are only engaged before their husband died can get married because there's again there's no concern of two husbands. Chutzman are such only the ones in Judea. Shimi plainly go basbehem. They often had relations before the actual marriage took place. Rabbi Yossi Omel kol anashimit are su chutzman almana. All women can get engaged. You don't have to worry about it, other than a widow, because she has to have some mourning time. So that's a different issue. So the first line we're dealing with is this, So there's six things listed there. Virgins, women who've already had relations, women who are divorced, women who are widowed, women who are married, and women who are engaged. So now the Gemara says, So virgins basically means they were engaged, because we're not talking about virgins who weren't even engaged, because they obviously wouldn't need to wait three months. Heniu be'ulot, ve'heniu nisuot. Be'ulot, ones who have relations, is the same as married women. So you're saying the same thing. So they say, this Amar of Yehuda Hachi Kamar. This is how it should read. Echab tulot, echab be'ulot, shet nit armelu, o shet nit garshu. Beim ena erusim, beim ena nisu. And it's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's one or two. Be'ulot or nis or be'ulot, which became either widowed or divorced. And whether it was from marriage or divorce. Okay, I'm sorry, marriage or engagement. Okay, so it's basically one line that talks about all this, right, about two basic cases. Or two cases that kind of split into were they widowed or were they divorced. And then was it from Erusin or was it from Gerushin? But it's not six cases that are parallel to each other. Amar, uh, Rabbi Elazar, lo ala be We now get a story. Rabbi Elazar didn't go to be midrash one day. Eshkechele Rabbi Asi finds Rabbi Asi. Amar le my amor rabbana be midrash. What are the rabbis saying in the be midrash today? What did they say? He said, what I learned today was that Rabbi Yochanan holds like Rabbi Yossi. That again, anyone can get engaged because you're not worried about marriage. So now they say, wait, if it was Tanakama versus Rabbi Yehuda versus Rabbi Yossi, usually Tanakama represents the rabbi's opinion, which is the majority. So why are you holding like Rabbi Yossi? Or why was Rabbi Yochanan holding? So Michlal di Yechida'a Paligale, he questions him and he says, right, Ram, Rabbi, who was it? Sorry, Rabbi Elazar asked Rabbi Asi, is it because he didn't think it was an, uh, uh, the Rabim? He didn't think Tanakhama was the majority, it was an individual's opinion? To which Rabbi Asi answers, in yes. It's actually just one individual's opinion, it's not the rabbi's opinion. How do I know this? Because there's a bright that says, We're now going to have all sorts of situations where it's clear that the woman was not living with her husband, and therefore it's clear she's not pregnant with him. So, with his child. So if she was always going to her parents' house and never really sleeping in her husband's house, there was a big fight between them, right? And they were separated. Or he was in jail. Or he was old or sick, couldn't have children. Or she was sick. Or she had a miscarriage after he already died. Clear, she's not carrying his child. Or she was barren. Or old. Or ketana. Or Ilonit, right? That woman who never reached maturity. Oshe Naru Yale later, for some other reason she can't have children. Rabbi Meir says, no matter what, you have to wait for three months. That matches Tanakam and our Mishnah, which shows that Tanakam is actually Rabbi Meir's opinion. And that's why he has a le- Rabbi Yochanan can pass like Rabbi Yossi over Rabbi Meir, because individual versus individual. And that same Braita brings a different opinion. Rabbi Yehuda Matir Learesu Lina Semiyad. He says you can get engaged or married immediately if you're a woman in one of these situations where it's clear you're not pregnant from your first husband. Amar Rabbi Chiyar, you're not pregnant at all, but clearly not from your first husband. Amar Rabbi Chiyar Ba'aba, Chazar Bo Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Chiyar Ba'aba comes and says Rabbi Yochanan changed his mind. 
Originally, he held like Rabbi Yossi. After that, he changed his mind and held like the like Tanakama, like Rabbi Meir. How do we? So now, Amar Rav Yosef, if he had a baby, Manita de Karma had baby. If he really changed his mind, it must be because he heard the Brita from that was taught in Karen Yavna. Remember, that's the term for Yavna when the, the Sanhedrin was there. And we're going to see the Brita right now. De Tanya, it says in the Brita, Amar Rabbi Yishmael ben Oshar Yochanan ben Broka, Shamati me Pichachamim be Karen Yavna. I heard from the rabbis in Karen Yavna, Kulan Srichalam Tin Shoshachodashim. So when Rabbi Yishmael said this, that all women need to wait, that was a decision they made in Karen B'yavda. It must be when Rabbi, Yehuda heard, Rabbi Yochanan heard that bright day, he changed his mind. That's what Rabbi Yosef assumes. I'm not Rabbi Yirmi, I'm Rabbi Zerika. Ki ailet kamed Rabbi Yavau. So Rabbi Yirmi says to Rabbi Zerika, when you get to Rabbi Yavau, uh, sorry, when I was in front of Rabbi Yavau, Rabbi Yirmi says, Rame, like someone asked the following question. Mi amar Rabbi Yochanan alachak to Rabbi Yossi? How could Rabbi Yochanan hold like Rabbi Yossi? That's why Rabbi Yochanan always hold by the Stam opinion of the Mishnah, the one that comes without a name. Utnan, and what does it say in our Mishnah? Right, they can't get married or engaged. They need to wait three months. etc. Right, and that seems clear. That's the Stam. And Rabbi Yochanan is known to always hold like the Stam. So Amarle, when Rabbi when Rabbi Yavau heard this, Rabbi Yirma is telling Rabbi Zreika, he said. Whoever suggested, oh, sorry, I think Amarle is, must be um, Rabbi Yirmiya says to, Rabbi Zreika says to Rabbi Yirmiya, whoever asked this question, doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm just going to check exactly who's talking to who. But anyway, means he wasn't concerned about his flower. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, there's different ways to understand that term. It's not so important for our purposes. Uh, okay, so sorry. Rabbi Yavau says it to Rabbi Zreka. Rabbi Zreka, when they got to the Beit Midrash, okay, sorry, let me explain it better if the, exactly, it's a little details aren't so important, but Rabbi Yirmiya said to Rabbi Zreka that when you go to Rabbi Yavau, ask him this question. Sorry, Rabbi Yirmiya tells Rabbi Zreka to ask that question to Rabbi Yavau, and then when Rabbi, when Rabbi um, Zreka asked the question to Rabbi Yavau, which was Rabbi Yirmiya's question, he says Rabbi Yirmiya doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? So why? Because stam v'achar kach, um, stam v'achar kach This case in our mission is not a regular case where Rabbi Yochanan Paskin's like the stam. It's a stam and then a machloket. It's Tanakama, then Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi. So basically, the stam appears and then a machloket. So when you have a stam v'achar kach machloket, ein alachak is stam. In that case, you don't hold like the stam. In other words, this isn't a classic case of stam. How do I know this? Tam Rav Papa, Avi Tam Rav Yochanan, and that's either Rav Papa said or Rav Yochanan. Machloket v'achar kach stam alachak stam. If first you have a machloket, then you get the stam opinion, then we hold like the stam. But stam v'achar kach machloket. If first you have an opinion, again, stam means unattributed, no name, which is what we had in our Mishnah. If first you have a stam, and then you have a machloket, which is our Mishnah, and alachak stam. Okay, so that just proved what he said. Mistamech va'azar Rabbi Yavau a kitfei to Rabbi Nachum Shamin. Okay, Rabbi Yavau was leaning on the shoulders of Rabbi Nachum his shamash, and what happened? Man kit va'azar hilchatei mine. So while they were walking, he started asking him halachic questions. Okay, so now here goes his question. Ba mine, and this continues with the discussion that we were just talking about. Um, just one second, right? So. Basically, what they explain is that what Rabbi Nachum was doing was he was collecting halachot, like what we hold like in certain situations. So then he asked him, Ba'amine, machloket v'achar kach stam. So now he asked Rabbi Yavau the following question. Exactly our issue. If you have a machloket and then there's a stam, then my, what's the situation, right? That's the reverse of our Mishnah. Amr leh, halacha stam. So then he says, stam v'achar kach machloket mai. Amr leh, ain halacha stam. This basically matches exactly what we saw just before. Stama de Manita, but then he asked a whole bunch of other things. If in the Mishnah, it's just one opinion. No machloket. U machloket be brighter. But then there's some other source which has a machloket. Then what do we say? My Amalei, halachak is stam. We pass him like the stam there. So then he says, Ha machloket be Manitin, the stama be brighter. My, what do we do if it's a machloket in a, in a bright, if it's a stam in a bright, in a brighter? But a machloket in the Mishnah, what do we do? So he answers him, Amar le, the chi Rebbe lo shna'a, Rabbi Chia menayim le. If Rebbe didn't teach it, then where did Rabbi Chia get it from? Okay, Rabbi Chia was known to, the Tosefta was attributed to him, and Rabbi, uh, Rebbe, the Mishnah was attributed to him. So we're basically saying, if in the Mishnah it didn't appear, and Rabbi Chia, who basically were assuming he was not just the Tosefta, but maybe he was in charge of all the other brights, 
if he, right, if Rabbi, if Rebbe didn't know what the halacha was, then who's Rabbi Chiga to say he knows? So basically, don't trust the Brighto over the Mishnayot. The Mishnayot would have superiority over the bright of the Mishnayot. So what would you do in this case? Machloken and Brighta, Stam, uh, Machloken and a Mishnah, Stam and a Brighta. You wouldn't go by the Stam for no reason. You would basically have to look into it and decide um, based on some other reason how you would paskin in that case. Okay, but not by these rules, basically. With that, we'll finish for today and we'll continue with this topic in tomorrow's class. Wadim Lissimcha.